Hey, my name's Akansha Malik, and I'm from Melbourne. Texan Sobby, it's Val here. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Hi, I'm Amy. Amy. I'm Prasant from California. Hi, I'm Jennifer Michael Smith. Hi, I'm Jennifer Marsman from the United States. Hi, I'm Jennifer Hi, I'm Jennifer Marsman from the United States. 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 Hi, I'm Jennifer Hey everyone, and welcome at another Global AI on Tour event. We reached uh, Belgium today, so I'm happy I'm in my home country today. Uh, but I'm not alone today. Uh, I brought Eve and Albert Jan and Rutger. So welcome everyone. Hi, welcome everyone. How are you guys doing? Really good. Great. Yeah. 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 And you? Yeah. I'm fine. I'm fine. It's uh, I would say it's almost weekend, but it's not. So that's <laughs> not even it feels like weekend. <laughs> Sometimes it does, but although it's very busy. <laughs> if who are you? Introduce yourself to the people who do not know you. So I am Eva Pardi, originally from Hungary, but now I'm talking from Denmark. I'm working as a data scientist and a software developer going out to com uh, community events to talk at uh, talk about my projects, researches, mostly about Azure Machine Learning, cognitive services, and uh, such tools that are available on the, on the Azure family. Cool. Albert, Jan, and Rutgen, who are you? <laughs> yeah, well, my name is Albert Jan. Most people call me Epi, so... Um... From this point forward, I will just say happy. That's easier. Um, I work at Viva, a Dutch company. We're from the Netherlands. And uh, we are mainly focusing on business productivity with Office 365. And over the last, let's say, year, I've discovered all the cool stuff that you have in AI and with the Azure platform. So we've been playing around with using AI in business productivity scenarios. And that's actually how I met Rutger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm uh, Rutger. Uh, well, in, in, in English, it's kind of hard to pronounce. So I always introduce myself as Roger because it's the closest I could think of. And, and I'm a, a technical cloud consultant also at Portifa. And uh, two years ago, I graduated on a, a topic with AI that included AI. And that's when my enthusiasm for AI really began. And I dragged Albert John into it. So uh, yeah, yeah sorry. here we are. <laughs> cool. Thanks, guys, for, for joining us today. Uh, we have another speaker who will join us later. He's uh, he's called Ali Beck, and he's from uh, from Paris. Uh, so we'll ask more about him later on. But of course, we're not just here to to hear who we are and what we do, but to see what we want to share with the public. If you're going to give us a lightning talk, data science and tutorials versus in real life, I'm really looking forward to what you have to tell us. So with I this, I'm going to show you. you the platform. Thank you a lot. I would like to share my screen to start with because I prepared a bit of a presentation as well. So, you know, I find it very important to talk about the difference between tutorials and real life. Um, I focus mostly on data science tutorials in this session, but I'm pretty sure that uh, similar issues can be spotted in other fields as well. And my motivation are all those conversations I had with uh, people who just got into the field of data science or just started with uh, reading a few articles about it. I work actively in this field for around five years now. And this field 10 years ago was called as uh, data mining. And uh, in the past few years, uh, a big bang just happened in the field of data science. And I found out how uh, data science and machine learning tutorials spread in the past few years. People search for these articles for six, eight times more in the past five years than before. And I don't have actual numbers about how many people study data science nowadays, but that number is uh, higher, way higher than it was uh, five years ago as well. 
So I meet a lot of people at uh, conferences or webinars or where I participate as a speaker or you know, sometimes I consult at companies and I often have the feeling that some people are very confused about uh, what is involved in the everyday life of a data scientist. Sometimes I ask these people where they heard all the strange things and they claim to read it in some, uh, some tutorials. And it turns out that uh, some tutorials include information that is uh, not necessarily stupid or a lie, but it can be misleading for those who are just getting started in this field. So let me quickly tell a bit more about myself. I'm a Microsoft AI MVP since February and uh, working in full time at Lerdil as a data scientist and software developer. Lerdil is a company who provides uh, online and, cl and classroom trainings as well for nurses and doctors all around the world to help them to save more lives. I also do a lot of community work, try to go and uh, speak at many conferences and meetups as possible to spread the knowledge and maybe the trust uh, for AI. I'm doing some blogging as well. Uh, on the bottom of this slide, you can find the link for my blog. And I often do mentoring for students who are trying to get into the world of data. If you want to reach out, you're welcome to follow me on Twitter. With the Eve party tag, you can find me. So I am here because I collected some information that uh, me and some other data scientists found at different tutorials. And we felt that, you know, this list is uh, quite misleading for those who are just uh, getting started in this field. My first one is one of our forever favorite is the pretty data set. A pretty data set is called pretty because everything just works on them. And you might have heard about this iris data set. And this includes altogether 250 rows. And it provides data about some flowers and their petals. And I'm pretty sure that this is just an artificial data set and not a single botanist has ever looked at it before. And you know, for it, this data set looks like that, that for each rose, it has two parameters, the length and the size of a petal. And then these ones can be categorized by botanists into three groups, the red, green, and the blue group. So when you look at the data set, or at this image, you can already see that it wouldn't be a big problem to put the elements into uh, groups because it's quite easy to identify the differences already based on this image. So maybe you want to ask from yourself first that do I actually need uh, machine learning to solve a problem like this? Many of the tutorials are actually applying machine learning algorithms on such a problem. And then they return being happy with 69% uh, uh, of accuracy. And in such tutorials, I would rather suggest you to just focus on the code and ignore the effectivity of uh, such a solution, because this would only teach you that uh, you need a good data set and choose a nice model. And then this would work like a gym together forever. And you have to believe me, this is not the case with real life data, not, not, not even close. But our other favorite is the Titanic data set. I think it's a really popular, popular since this is the one that has been uh, given to newcomers in the field uh, who wants to learn about data science. And you might know this site, this uh, Kaggle. Uh, this is a place that uh, provides data sets and challenges for nerds like me who actually enjoy spending time on uh, coding competitions. And this data set includes attributions about uh, people who boarded the Titanic. And we would pre predict based on this data who would survive the tragedy and who would not. And this is really, I would say, practical <laughs> because we, we know this information already, don't we? So. But the story is close to us. It influences our feelings, which maybe makes us more motivated to learn and understand the data science processes. So the reason why we don't like this data set is because it uh, teaches us the wrong thing. It tells us that we have to uh, divide the data set equally and uh, use it as training and testing data. 
it is true we would use the training and then uh, data for validation as well um, but in the end of each uh, iteration uh, we would not just you know just divide a data set for a production version of a model especially when you want to predict the future you should look at the past uh, for samples and examples first. And in this case, a uh, data scientist would investigate similar uh, scenarios, similar catastrophes from the previous, I don't know, 50 years, and would build up a model based on this information. So instead of dividing the data set into two halves, in this case, you should predict the outcome of a similar situation in the future based on the past data or experience that we got from the Titanic catastrophe. Divide a data set randomly. You know, I know someone who would actually forbid dividing a data set randomly. All or most of the tutorials state, since it's just one line of code to do that, that when you create training and test data set from your data, you should divide it randomly. And in this case, uh, some data would be used for training uh, the machine learning model and some data would be used for validating that. And these tutorials say, uh, for example, we have uh, red and green balls in a bucket or a hat, and, and we want to predict which color we would pick. And for this, uh, we divide the data set randomly and, uh, and generate a data set for training and testing. And then this machine learning model uh, would uh, use the training data set. And then on the test data set, it would uh, decide whether the ball is going to be red or green. And this machine is learning from experience again, which is why it is important to provide a balanced data set for training. And in tutorials, we see that it is always balanced. It is always perfectly useful, and it is just ready to go into the machine learning model. And then it learns from it, and it is returning, uh, again, a more than 90% accuracy, saying that I'm sure that it is a red ball. But in real life, imagine that if you divide a red and a green balls randomly, there is a very high probability that the training data set will have, for example, more red balls than green balls, and or on the other way around, of course. And the machine uh, trained on this data set will most of the time return that the ball is red when it actually would be green. In tutorials, you often see a diagram like this. And this is suggesting that each element of a life cycle of a data science project or each of the elements of it has the same length and that it is easy to define it and identify it. And I heard a story from a data scientist a consultant who met the project owner of a company, and they had a three hours long session where the consultant showed uh, how a specific problem could be solved. And then the project owner asked how long this project would take, and the data scientist replied, well, like two or three months. Then the project owner was going like, like how? You just did it in three hours. But that's because for a meeting, for a session, or for even a tutorial, you prepare the, prepare the data uh, so it's ready to use. You implement the model, get the resources ready, and, and uh, make the whole thing squeezed into this three hours or one hour, right? In such cases, you act like a, like a producer making a new movie, and you organize the steps in a way that it uh, brings you somewhere in the end, before the end of the session, possibly. <laughs> but in real life, this is not how it works. The data set is never available without spending a lot of time on uh, fixing the issues, do some transformation, cleaning, featureization, and so on, before you could send it for training. And you make the machine learning model that returns a result, then you had to take a look at the evaluation and maybe go back, do some fixes again on the data, make more features, make more uh, changes on the algorithm maybe. And you know, it, you have to keep going back and it just you cannot just uh, define it like this, like how long will the project take because of these, uh, these uh, issues you might have to fix. So you see, it uh, takes a lot of time in the real life. So when you're working with uh, such a project, I would suggest you to tell your boss that, OK, you would uh, maybe spend a few days on, on making a good estimation on how long does it take, and then maybe come back with uh, something real life like project length. 
Many tutorials use a business scenario that seems like the simplest thing to turn into a machine learning problem. My favorite one was uh, this bank who, in this scenario, it was a pretty huge bank actually, and who wanted to decide whether their customers uh, would stay or, or go. The data provided uh, sort of a balanced um, information. So it offered similar amount of uh, data about people who are still customers of the bank and of those who has already left it. And from this tutorial, the data scientist could uh, build a simple classification model based on this data set and that returned whether the user would stay or leave the bank with a very good accuracy. Now, in real life, uh, banks don't have such a balanced data set. Most of the time, 90% of the users are still customers of the bank and only maybe 10% uh, have left the bank. So this data is so skewed and without proper fixes and featureization, this model would most of the time uh, return that the user is going to be at this bank forever. And uh, because it doesn't have enough uh, examples of those who would uh, leave it. Tutorials often state that you should throw out outlier values from your data set when you want to train a model. Let me tell you a big secret. You should not in any circumstances do that in real life ever. Let's say you would have to make a prediction based on a data set that uh, has uh, buildings and their properties, and you have to make a decision whether they would collapse or not uh, during the next earthquake. And most of these buildings are between five to 10 years old, and uh, there are some that is maybe 50 years old. And if you would follow the tutorial, such a tutorial that's saying you had to throw out the outlier values, we would uh, train our model with uh, fairly new buildings. And we know that uh, these, has, uh, these have a very low risk of damage, and uh, it would be also uh, used for training and validation as well. And in the in return, our machine returning with 90% uh, of accuracy saying our buildings are strong and they will standing forever. But then you get a request from your customer to see the prediction on new data, which includes historical buildings as well. And if you think about it, uh, with using your own intelligence, not an artificial one, these ones should have a high risk of damage since these are old buildings, uh, went through a lot of corrosions as well. So now your artificial intelligence model through uh, trained, uh, that are trained on quite strong buildings, new ones that are using stronger materials and everything, your model would return low risk of damage for all the buildings. Then the earthquake comes and no one would understand how the statue collapsed because no one expected it don't throw out outlier values. You can do some normalization on it or uh, some different algorithms on your data set, but you have to include all the possible scenarios. Many tutorials focusing a lot on uh, making sure that the data set given to a machine learning model to train on uh, that should only use uh, numerical data. For this example, the writers uh, usually turn string categories to numerical categories, uh, sign some numbers from one to N, depending on how many categories there are. But my favorite is when they turn things to numbers that cannot really be measured. For example, let's go back to the bank scenario when we wanted to define how reliable is a customer. How would you define reliability? Or could you like give it a number, like a range, how uh, loyal is a person? Uh, can it be defined in a one to 10 range or put it into a bucket that, okay, this person is reliable, that person is not? Fun fact from Hungary. Um, it was a few years ago when uh, Hungary changed uh, the phone numbers from six digits to seven digits. And instead of rearranging all the numbers, they decided that the cost customers that are already using phone numbers are just going to get a nine in the, as the first digit of the phone number. And so this information could be used how reliable is a person because those people whose phone number is starting with nine, those are you know, paying the bills for the same company for many years now.
So that's funny. But you know, some parameters cannot be turned into numerical data in real life because it might occur more problems than solu solutions, especially if you don't define the range well. Many tutorials tell you that you just do these steps once, or you just have to implement your machine learning once, and then you can use that for all kinds of different scenarios. And um, you can use it for whatever problems, really. I suggest you to not believe that too much. A model is usually trained on a data set which uh, works together very well. And as soon as the data changes or gets more uh, features or something, you might have to do the training again, or even maybe change something in the parameters of your algorithms. You can try to use your previously built models as a schema, uh, but keep that in mind that it might won't work um, in the best way like it did for your previously uh, with your previous setup. And in connection to this, tutorials use, usually suggest that if you have enough data, your model will work better. Again, every time your data set gets updated, you might need to retrain your model. Also, there is uh, no such thing as enough data. What is enough? Like one row, uh, 100 rows, a million rows, or, or what is enough? In real life, your data set will never have um, a data set including all possible situations. And you often meet new issues uh, throughout the evaluation step of the iteration. So I would rather say that you should always know your data as much as possible. And that would allow you to build a better fitting model for your data set for all possible scenarios. The last point I see very often in tutorials even in my own ones, that it shows you that your project can be finished in only two or three uh, iterations. But remember, in a tutorial, you want to show some progress, the big changes, the big steps forward, and, and, and you know, return uh, the perfect uh, accuracy in just a few iterations. In real life, you would spend uh, a lot more iterations for a problem, like maybe weeks, months. I'm working, for example, on a project for years now to, to refine it always, get more data, more features, and all that. The reason behind the number of cycles is that you prepare the data in a way that it can be used for a model. You, you uh, prepare the model, do the training and scoring, and then take a look at the evaluation result. And after each evaluation, you go back to the beginning and do some improvement and see how the results look after that change. And um, you never want to do two different fixes uh, in the same step. Otherwise, how would you know uh, what improved or messed up your evaluation results? The safest way is to make your fixes step by step. Also, uh, there is nothing as a perfectly working model. You spend a long, long time uh, doing these uh, steps to go back and forth like a million times for long, long, long cycles, and then deliver your project, and you can still keep improving it in the future as well. This is, I think, why uh, machine learning as a field itself is improving also every day. I hope I could give you some ideas about how the real life of a data scientist look like uh, compared to what you can see in tutorials. But after all this, I still highly recommend you to go and uh, get started with all these tutorials. But remember to focus on the relevant information and don't let yourself to be led on a wrong way. Thank you very much. Cool, Eve, that was a nice talk. But yeah, let's be honest. We've all given probably trainings about certain <laughs> products and we always show the nice side of the product. <laughs> yes, in 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah, at the end, tutorials is just to give introductions and to, to inspire people. Yeah. Eh? Exactly. Uh, yes. I always feel guilty for showing you a demo in a few seconds. <laughs> I think it was funny to start with this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Eve, thank you very much. Um, I thank you too. There's no questions at the moment. 
Um, but if there are, well, I guess people can send you a message on your Twitter handle, which was at Eve Pardee. So you can always reach her that way. So thank you very much, Eve. Uh, thank you. You can stay with us for the rest of this evening or you can go, what's on, what's your choice? Of course so, I'm saying, I would like to see the next. <laughs> uh, cool, 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 happy for, to hear that. Mm. Okay, Albert-Jan and Rutger, we're going straight to you before your building is closing. <laughs> yeah, so so we are in our office and they're actually closing in an hour. So we, we have to make sure that we're done in that hour. They'll drag us out otherwise, so. But I'm pretty sure that we can make it. So cool. let's start. We did share our screen. Everything should be should be there. Let me go yeah. to the right. I want that to be the button. There you go, Rutger. Yeah. Tell us. So basically, two years ago, I uh, graduated. I said it in my introduction. I graduated uh, in computer science uh, with a topic uh, that included building a complex chatbot. So uh, with artificial intelligence. And uh, during this period, I met Lewis, the language understanding intelligence service of Microsoft. And that's where I really got into enthusiastic about AI because um, at school, you know, you, you learn about programming and different services and such. And I always thought like, you know, AI, it's, it's for the future. It's like Terminator and, and killer robots and stuff. And then I thought like, no, we already can use it. And I was already using it without knowing it. And that was a real mind opener, a mind uh, opening experience. So that was awesome. Um, so after I graduated, I, uh, I joined the company and um, yeah, I was really enthusiastic about AI and about doing stuff with it. So for me, those were the best of times, really. Yeah, and that's when I met Rutger and for me, it's actually the worst of times because I was working at a really, really cool customer, let's say that. Mm -hmm. But what I was doing was the old way of doing things. I was still doing stuff on premises and I, I knew about Azure because of other customers I work with Azure, but that this specific company was really, really into rules and regulations. And they were like, we're not allowed to go to cloud and Office 365, no way that we're gonna use it. Azure, ugh, please don't talk about it. So we really, or I at least had a, a hard time um, well, enjoying what I was doing. I was really, really struggling. And then I met Rutger and we started discussing AI and I was like, okay, I'm not a data scientist, but it sounds interesting. Is there anything I can do with it? Do I need to follow another training or can I just start with it? And Rutger was like, let's start building. Mm -hmm. And that was where the fun began. So what Rutger actually showed me was the JFK demos. I'm not sure if you've seen it, the JFK demos. It's a Azure website. It's, it's spun up by Microsoft. And basically it's an AI, AI model where they loaded a bunch of content. And in that content, you can actually search and you can see some of the goodness that AI is actually bringing you. So if you would open that site, you would see that it's the JFK files you can search. And basically what I did is they indexed a whole bunch of documents and they did things with that content like text recognition, entity extraction, all abstract things that for me were quite new. But when I saw the demo, I was like, okay, that makes sense. Apparently you can have your AI model, look at data and then tell you things about the text, can do uh, text recognition. So that makes sense. So I started clicking through and I was like, okay, this is well really interesting. I can, uh, can tag things, I can uh, search for things. I can just go through the different things that are in there. And apparently there is a knowledge graph or a graph of entities that are linked together. So like, okay, this is well, really interesting. Um, is there anything that we can do with that? Do we need to, um, well, work with it? Do I need to become a data scientist or can I just start using with it? And that's where we actually started to discuss what we can do. And in the end, what we did is we started working with SharePoint because a lot of companies are already using SharePoint and we wanted to use AI in SharePoint. And that's where our love story began mm, actually. Yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. So, well, that's actually where the real fun began. So what we try to do is we try to build a model, work with a model, use that against our SharePoint data and do, do things like entity extraction, language detection, custom learning models, anything that you can do within Azure. 
And the most important part here is that we wanted to do it without actually having going uh, to go to Azure because our customer was really focusing on not doing anything in Azure. Now, before we show you what it actually will look like, we quickly want to touch some Project Cortex. So Microsoft did announce Project Cortex at the last Ignite, so it's almost a year ago already, time flies. Mm -hmm. And when they announced Project Cortex, what it actually promised us is that you get knowledge within your SharePoint environment. So they are using AI, AI models, machine learning, machine teaching, all nice and fancy terms to tag your content in your SharePoint environment and do, in, well, do something with it. And the thing is, it only works in Office 365. So Project Cortex will be running in SharePoint Online, period. And what it will do is, well, a few things, among others, image and text recognition, form processing, machine touch, uh, teaching. So it all sounds really fancy. What actually happens is it picks up all that content and then it creates knowledge entities. And those knowledge entities are created in a knowledge center and allows you to go through content and see the knowledge in your organization. And how they do that, they provide you with a knowledge card. So if you hover over a knowledge entity, you'll see a nice view where you can see similar content against content or people cards. And if you click on it, you go to a topic page within that knowledge center. So that's all pretty interesting. And the thing is, when Microsoft announced that, there were quite a few customers who were like, we need that, mm -hmm. but we need it on-prem. Yeah. No way that we go to the cloud. So that's where our discussion actually started. We want to do something with this information and see what we can do. Now, if you would go to Project Cortex, it's going to be released pretty soon. What you will actually see if you go to a page, you'll see this knowledge entity. And if you hover over it, what you will see is you see a description, you see expert finding, you see content that is tagged or is aligned with this, uh, with, this, uh, with this topic, and you can see experts. So you can see that there are quite a few different things that you can use or that you can reuse within Project Cortex. Now, remember, only on-premise or only in the cloud, only on online, so no way that you can do things with this on-premises. Now, if you look to the technical part, if you go to it, what you will actually see, if you go to your knowledge center, you get an overview of the topic itself. You get a description, you get people, you get resources, you get sites, you get related topics, you get questions and answers. So all kinds of content that is apparently tagged with this knowledge entity and that is using this information to, well, um, extend the content that you have in SharePoint, because that's basically what's happening. You do have content in SharePoint files or sites, and you want to see what is related to it, or you want to see what you can actually um, leverage or extend with it. Now, the final thing that is in there is something like Form Recognizer. You probably all have seen that before as well. Form Recognizer, a Azure service where you can upload your form and you get a response if you would upload your form with key value pairs and you can use those key value pairs based on the content of your form to add it as metadata to your content so if you would have a pdf with some table in it with some numbers or address uh, you can actually extract that data and use it in your sample Obviously, there are some requirements. It has to be um, recognizable. It has to be a correct format. But things like this are actually available, and you can use that in Azure. But what if you're on-prem? Because everything we've shown you so far is in One, the cloud, yeah. only, only in the cloud. So there are some, um, well, some downsides of that. Some customers are not going to the cloud, period, mm -hmm. and you want to do things on premises. So in our case, the case that we ended up working with, we had a customer and they had a really, really large set of unstructured data. So let's say they scanned all their content, large set of data, PDF, some Word, PowerPoint, whatever. All the data was stored on a external hard drive or a file share, and it was all data. They've created it over the last 50 years, and there was just, they had their backup, but they weren't doing anything with the data. 
but still there was really some intel, some experience in those sets of data. There were reports on how they actually built things for years or lessons learned from projects that they run over a period of 10 years. So there were actually, well, knowledge in that file share, but nobody knew, no, no one knew. <laughs> so the data was not searchable. And obviously if you would have a file share, you can do some things with search, but not that much. And no full text search was configured, meaning that you could only search for the file names. So there were quite a few downsides of that approach, the data that they have. And there was no data captured because, well, 60 years ago, apparently you wouldn't mm -hmm. capture data, you would just put it on a file share. And there was this nice folder structure of over a gazillion folders and folders and folders and folders oh, to just make some sense of the data. So really, really unstructured data. And then the last one, and that's a pretty important one, the legal requirements prevented us to putting anything in the cloud. So the full data set was not allowed to the cloud, period. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sad about that because it would make life a, bit a lot easier. A lot easier. Yep. But still, we weren't allowed. So in that case, we started looking at alternatives. So what can you do if you're on premises? What can you do with your data if you are not allowed to put your data to the cloud. And the first scenario that we started working on or that we start thinking about had nothing to do with AI. No. I mean, making content searchable has nothing to do with AI. So what we did is we created a SharePoint environment. And in that SharePoint environment, what we did is we just crawled our network share. On the top, line, on the top left, you will see that we created a network share. The network share would just be indexed by SharePoint, meaning that we would have full text search period yep. and that's a cool thing because if you have full text search you can just search through the content that you would have you could search for tags you could search for uh, authors you could search for anything that's in your files already as long as those files were indexed by your search server pretty straightforward now the next step, that's actually where it gets interesting because if that data is in your search index, there is something called the content enrichment service and that content enrichment service allows you to call external APIs or call other services that you wanted to call and go through um, whatever process you decide that you should uh, that you should actually go through. So what we did is we created our own web service. The web service was still running locally, and that web service could do some data scrubbing, could either decide whether we were allowed to go to the cloud for this file or not, because you can build any logic that you want in your own web service. Mm -hmm. You have full control over it, right? Makes sense. But what it really gets interesting is that from that data, uh, that we have calling a web service, we could also call Lewis or any other Azure uh, AI services mm -hmm. that we want. We could call custom vision or we could call text analytics or whatever we like, but that would still reside in the cloud. So interesting, but only available for a subset of our data. Then the next step, whoops, let me go back to my slides. Not sure what happened there. Click. Yeah, there, there we, we go. So if you go through the motions, SharePoint will provide us with full text search. That's something that's out there, nothing we need to do. Then the content processing, we can inject our own intelligence. We call, call, can call the API, whatever we want to put in the API can be there. Then our logic can be decided to either call the cloud if we are allowed because the data is anonymous or the data is not classified as highly classified and we could call just our Lewis model where Lewis can provide intents and entities that can be written back to our search results. Meaning that in this setup, what we can do is we can call a model, a AI model in the cloud, get our entities, get our utterances, inject them back into our search pipeline and use that information when people are searching for content. So this was our first proof of concept because we wanted to prove that AI could actually extract data from our set with information or set with information and use that to add added value. Now where it really gets interesting is because if you look at Lewis, what you have, you have three options. You've got utterances, intents, and entities. So 
let's go through them really, really quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically where it gets really interesting uh, for my part, AI uh, is Lewis, the language understanding Int intelligence service. So what it does, it creates an AI trained model uh, that contains out of three main categories, which are utterances, intents, and edit entities. So imagine we're throwing something to Lewis, like a, a big, big blob of text. And um, we want to know, all right, so what do we want with it? Like, what is our intent? What does a user mean? Uh, the utterance would be whatever we throw to Lewis and the entities, like what kind of parameters are in this text? What do I need to extract out of it? So what we did is we threw all those documents to Lewis. Of course, we had to data clean, clean something because uh, we couldn't just throw like pages and uh, tens of thousands of pages to it. So we had to make sure we're um, throwing like really uh, the, the parts we want to include, which we want to extract to Lewis. So we sent some documents, some, some parts of the document to Lewis, uh, which are the utterances. And then the intent was, all right, get me metadata. Uh, and the entities could be the description which they found in the document or the author which was always included somewhere in the first four uh, pages or the date of publishment or uh, the ISBN number which is a unique number which identified the published page. Um, so that's what we what we threw to Lewis really. Um, and yeah, that's basically what Lewis does. So it, it contains utterances, whatever a user says, the intent, what a user means and entities. So basically you're saying, because I knew Lewis from chatbot stuff, so mm. you can use Lewis for other things than just chatbots, right? Oh yeah, so basically the, the common uh, example you would see is, all right, Lewis, uh, I want to book a, a ticket for two to, I don't know, Ibiza or something. Then the intent is book a flight or book tickets, and then the parameter or the entity would be two tickets to Ibiza. So that would be common in a chatbot environment, but we didn't have a chatbot so we kind of abused lewis but it's not abusing if it works and if it fits your needs so i well, mean so, sounds good yeah. sounds good <laughs> so how does that mean that because you say lewis and lewis in, is in azure what what does that mean because we weren't allowed to use azure right mm -hmm. no we weren't allowed to use azure so um uh, some parts we could use and some parts not but we can if, even be smarter we can run lewis on premise oh that sounds interesting yeah. so what did we do well, we did um, create a Docker container. So a Docker runs locally wherever you want it. It can be a smartphone, it can be a website, it can be uh, a VM somewhere in your own environment. And what you can do is you can grab the Lewis model. I mean, uh, Lewis is basically trained on utterances you provide, training the data, uh, uh, calling out the parameters which are in there, uh, training the model. And then once that model is trained, you can export it and you can use that export, which is a containerized image, and you can use it in your Docker container. So, so you're saying you can train data in the cloud and mm -hmm. you could use either dummy data or anonymous data, yep. or um, I know there are companies specializing in making sure that the data that you want to train against is actually um, scrubbed mm -hmm. of identifiable information yep. and train against that. And then once you've got a trained model, you can use it yep. uh, locally. Yeah, you don't have to re use real data as long as the structure you're, you're yeah. training the model on looks the same as what you would use in a production environment. Yeah. So that sounds good to me because mm -hmm. I'm no data scientist. And well, honestly, I tried learning data science, but I really found it mm -hmm. really, really hard. And well, as a developer, I know Docker. So that right. sounds good. So for you who don't know Docker yet, Docker is pretty straightforward. It's a virtualization layer. So what it allows you to do is Within a Docker, you can create a so-called container and your Docker container contains a application and that application is run on a host operating system on an infrastructure. And if you don't know it, there are a gazillion samples yeah. out there that you can use. But basically what we did is we just trained our model in Lewis and we used that uh, well that published model as a Docker container and start working from there, right? Yeah. That sounds good. That sounds really good. So let's have a quick look. I'm not sure why it's going gray again. That should be better. Let's go have a look at a demo. So let's go to classifying your SharePoint data. The first thing that we want to do is we want to go through Lewis. Just to walk me through, let me or help me understand what, what Lewis will actually do. Let me find 
Lewis. There you go. Yes. Just walk me quickly through what we've done in Lewis. So basically, when you create an application in Lewis, uh, which is all available through a portal, Lewis.ai, uh, basically you create an application which will be your model. So here we have the Lewis on-prem demo model. And that sounds like a good demo. There we go. Yeah, it sounds good, right? <laughs> Lewis on-premise demo. Of course, this is still in the cloud, by the way. So um, I know the application says uh, on-premise. This is still in the cloud, but we're going to uh, export it so we can run it locally. So here we see two intents. And uh, the intent, again, is something you'd like to do with whatever you're uh, throwing to Lewis. So we, here we have to get metadata and the non-intent. And the non-intent is actually required because Lewis needs to know uh, uh, whatever intent he needs to throw back. Uh, so whenever he cannot find uh, the context, he will just throw none, which is also very good for debugging purposes because, I mean, if you throw something to Lewis and he doesn't understand it, uh, you need to do something with it. So um, for, for this uh, example, we created the get metadata intent. And when you click on that, you basically see some of the utterances, so examples um, that I trained the model with. So for example, we are uh, we need to uh, get some metadata from uh, Lewis, from the model. Uh, for example, uh, a description, a location, and an author. So I created some example utterances and I trained the model with it. So here we see, for example, a description, who reads this anyway, location, Spain, project reference, can we do it, and author Alice. So this is dummy data. This is not data we actually used in a production environment, but it's good enough to train the model with. So when you, uh, for example, create like 15 or 20 uh, sample utterances, you can actually get a very nice prediction score. So when you call Lewis uh, with a query, for example, uh, with the description and location and, and whatever parameters you need to know, uh, Lewis can actually identify very quickly uh, the intent and the param parameters you included. So with 15 to 20 utterances, example messages, Lewis gets really, really um, uh, to the point. So now, for example, we trained this, this model, right? We trained it and then we have to publish it. And normally when you publish it, you can use the API to get back the intents and uh, entities, but we yeah. couldn't use that because this is all in the cloud. So how do you get this model which is very sophisticated, how can you get that on an on-premise environment? That's where we can export this entire model with just a few clicks. Uh, versions, so we go to versions. Uh, with the Lewis model, you can create multiple versions for uh, production development uh, purposes. Um, so you can actually have a version history of when the app you, uh, worked really great, and uh, then you can retrain it to get it even better. So here we have uh, a version 1.0.1. We click on that, and then we could export the entire model. I mean, the entire model, it, it's crazy. I mean, just think about it. You're downloading an entire AI model uh, with just like a few megabytes big. It, it's, it's crazy. So when you export this, you get a zip file, uh, which you then can use as an image uh, in Docker, basically. Then there are a few buts. Um, for example, uh, you would need to have um, a resource, an Azure resource, if you want to use this. So um, normally you would get the starter key, which is uh, free to use and you can use it. Um, but if you want to use containerized uh, Lewis images, you're gonna need to uh, get a, uh, yeah, a Lewis resource on Azure because uh, billing applies and stuff like that. You can still use the free tire but um, yeah, you, you need at least a Lewis a resource on Azure. And when you have all that, and for example, what we used, a virtual machine with uh, minimum requirements of two gigabytes of, of memory, which is nothing, uh, you're all set to go and use Lewis on premise. So that sounds good. Let's go to the demo. One question. Um, what's a good practice to model the intents on my app? Should I create more specific or more generic intents? Yeah, that's a really good, good, good question. And it's basically what you're uh, expecting the model to be used with. For example, you can create uh, um, what, what I saw when I first started with Lewis. I was creating this chatbot, right? And with this chatbot, you could uh, ask for information. And I, I quickly understood that that the, there were a lot of intents that my chatbot was using, like uh, do this or get information about that. And when I uh, put all the utterances into one intent, for example, get information, 
uh, Lewis could get quite cracky on uh, what kind of information do you need. So for that purpose, when you're at that moment, like you're seeing the prediction score goes down, um, it's either way a good moment to create new intent and train that intent purpose uh, solely for that purpose, or it's time to uh, look at your model again and think if you need to yeah, do it some way uh, other. So you're sounding like a consultant saying yeah, it depends. It depends, really. <laughs> it depends on the purpose, yeah. My best best practice or my experience is that we try to start um, as generic as possible mm -hmm. uh, because then like uh, you take big steps, you can show results fairly quickly. But like we saw in the, in the presentation before by, by Eve, it's all about iterations, yeah. defining your model, making it better, making it better, making it better, learning, 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 and just keep adding value to your model. So I would try to start as generic as possible but get more specific if you see the, the confidence score actually dropping. And the cool thing is that you can actually test that. So if you go to test, you can try, uh, you can test your, your current model and you can see the exact confidence score for demo questions that you are trying. So if I would go here, I would type in, uh, let's do, uh, this is a demo. You will actually see that it's, low score. It, it has a low score. It, it's fairly small, but it says it has a 0.48 score on the get metadata. So apparently this is a really bad demo, not a good demo um, in, in this case. So that means that I should either add more intense, more training data, or reconsider whether this is actually something yeah. I want to catch with this intent and add a, uh, well, a different or a new intent if I if I need it. For, if I need it. Yeah, and don't be scared to experiment with that because you have versioning. I mean, uh, if it doesn't work in the next revision, uh, just roll it back. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, don't be scared to just first go generic and then uh, create more uh, intense with purpose. So yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. So quickly go back. Let me go back here basically if i click on this export for containers it takes a second to actually zip that file for me and you will see here that i get this nicely um it's, it's really small i can't open it but it's a it's a file it contains the model that i'm working with and that means that i can use this model on my uh, on my environment or anywhere i would like it to so like Rutger said we could run it on a mobile phone if i wanted to yeah. in our case we were running on sharepoint we are doing things with sharepoint and we want to see what we can do uh what we can do here so what we did is we created an environment in Azure. So we said it's going to be run locally. The VMs that I used are doing anything locally, but the VM itself is living in Azure because I have a laptop that didn't allow me to run three different servers to actually do this. Uh, it has nothing to do with Azure, just believe me. Um, going through my, uh, through my server environment, what you see here is I've got a SharePoint environment. So if I go here, you'll just see SharePoint on-premises. It's running a local URL. There's nothing in the cloud here, and that's just it. Now, what I did is, or what Rutger and I did actually, is we installed Docker. So the first thing that you will need to do is you actually have to install Docker. And if you go to your settings, you'll just can install Docker for Windows, a Docker desktop, whatever you like. There are a few prerequisites of running Docker on your Azure VM. You have to have the Hyper-V features enabled. If you have enabled them, then they should, uh, should be working. One of the things that I encountered is that because I'm running in a, um, well, a proper SharePoint environment. That means that if I would start Docker, it's not running with elevated privileges. So if you want to do anything with containers, you have to run it with elevated privileges, run as administrator, otherwise you would, your Docker wouldn't start. So the Docker engine just would be like, okay, I can start, I don't have access to specific files. That won't be done, nothing will actually happen. And one of the things that I had on my Azure VM is that if you go to your Docker, you can actually switch to different container types. So you can switch to Windows containers or switch to Linux containers. If you want to do anything with Lewis or any of the AI models that you have in Azure, you actually have to run a Linux container image, otherwise it won't work. And I had a problem that after I installed Docker, I actually have to switch to Windows and then switch back to Linux before it recognized that I was running Linux containers. But that's probably just a glitch of my VM. Just wanted to make you uh, aware of that. Okay. But if you have Docker running, 
meaning your Docker engine is running, you can see here Docker. That means that I could go to my command prompt or to PowerShell, whatever you, uh, your preferred experience is. The only thing that you have to be aware of that if you want to do anything with Docker, run it as an elevated uh, command prompt. If you do that, that means that you can interact with your Docker engine and you can download or start working with it. Now, the cool thing is that it's, uh, it's pretty easy. The first thing that you will need to do is you actually have to put or pull the Docker container and that's just Docker pull and then the container that you're the image that you want to, uh, that you want to pull. So if I would do this, then it would probably say that I already have stuff running, but well, there we go. Pulling image, there we go. Image is already up to date. No need to, to um, well, add it or change it. And then the second thing that I need to do is because once I've Docker running and I've pulled my image, what I need to do is actually get that file that I just downloaded and put it somewhere at a location that I can use. So what I did is I created a new folder called Lewis and I created an input folder and that file that I've just downloaded, I put in here. And here you can see that my complete model, everything that is trained is less than a meg. It's actually 160 kilobytes that my trained model is. Nothing fancy there. It's crazy. Sample file, fairly easy. Then the second thing that you'll need to do is once that model is in place, you actually have to use it. So let me go here. Let me go to my format let me change my font a bit make it a little bit bigger so we can actually walk through the different settings that i need to do so there we go here you can see what i then need to do is i will need to run docker basically i have to start my image makes sense right you download an image you download your model and then you want to run it run the yeah. image otherwise the image is not running mm -hmm. your api is not accessible you can specify what you need, and Microsoft recommends to have at least four gigs of memory and run it on two, C on two CPUs. I created a, I think, V3D2 image, so should be good there. And one of the things that you'll need to do is you'll need to both mount your input and your output folder. So here you'll see that it will look at this location to my model. It will validate if the model is there. If the model is not there or your Docker container does not have access to this location, it will fail. It will tell you, I don't have access. I can't start. I'm not allowed to do anything. You also need a output folder. And that output folder is used as a sort of temp drive where uh, temporary files will be uh, stored and created. Second thing is you can say, hey, I'm using this specific image. And you can see that this URL that you see here is actually the same URL as the URL we just pulled in as a Docker container. Obviously, you'll need to accept some, uh, well, some specific settings. Um, you can try to ignore that, but then you will get this nice pop-up saying you need to accept it. And you will need to set both billing and API key. And in here, there should be a valid API key that allows you to interact with your Azure, um, um, Azure group. If your API key is not valid, you're not allowed to call your locally created model. So even though it's not going through the cloud, there's no data sent to Azure, it will validate whether your API key is valid. And once you have run this, you can, uh, well, use curl or we are using SharePoint or whatever you're using, and you can call Lewis by using this URL. And what you need to do is you get a local host, you'll get a specific endpoint. Within that endpoint, there is a app identity. Okay. Yep. The app identity is actually the app identity of your Lewis model that you've created in Azure. So this has to be a valid created app identity, if it's not valid, again, it will fail. Uh, things will not work. And then whoops, you can actually see that we're just calling the predict endpoint. And within that predict endpoint, if you scroll back a little bit, you have to specify a specific query. And the query is what you're sending to your model. So normally, you would call Lewis uh, the public endpoint. You would also need to specify a app ID and a valid authentication header, and you would need to specify your query. Now, what you can do is you can actually call this either from using curl, or you can use PowerShell, or you can use basically anything you like, but you can use that and enrich your SharePoint data. So let's go to SharePoint. 
let's create a new item and let's give it a title. Let's call it dummy title. We're not doing anything with the title. We're just strapping the description. Now, Rutger, what should I put in the description? Uh, what, what data makes sense? What data makes sense? So we have, uh, let's say, uh, this is a nice purposed demo with Albert John and Rutger. Uh, it Rutger can be any demo. kind of text, basically. Uh, ooh. Demo by Albert John. And Rutger. No, that's a nice description of this new text. Article. So obviously, because we're now using a SharePoint list, this could also be a SharePoint document. Mm -hmm. It could be a SharePoint page, a news page, anything, any type of data that you stored, you could save here. Now, if I would save it, there won't be any Lewis result. It's empty. Now, all I need to do is if I want to run this locally, I do have some PowerShell open here. Basically, all I need to do is I'll need to connect to my location. This is just uh, SharePoint PowerShell. Ignore the SharePoint PowerShell. I need to get the list. Again, you can ignore it. I need to get all the items in the list. Again, you can ignore it. But basically, all I need is I'll need to get that description. And that description is then something I can add. I can construct a new URL. Here you can see that I still call the predict endpoint. I specified some additional parameters like verbose is false, log is false. I could put the log to true to see what the output is. Um, and then I'll need to specify the query, the URI query, and the query should be a escaped data string. It should be escaped, otherwise I'm not allowed to send it through. And then what I can do is I can just invoke a web request with this URL and that will run through my local host and it will get a response, and then I will set this response to the current item that I'm updating. So I'm gonna copy this, I'm gonna run this, let's connect, and anything should be going fine. There you see that I've got a dummy title, and if I now go to my content item, and I would refresh my page, what actually would be happening is that this Lewis result in my dummy title should be pre-filled, and as you can see, it is. And let me zoom in a bit. What it did is it explained that it hit my get metadata intent and it was 91% sure, pretty good, but it didn't get any entities. So it didn't recognize any entities, but it did get my intent, get metadata. That basically means that I should retrain, retrain. my model, add some additional entities, train some more, explain some more, and then obviously re, well, uh, retrain, republish, and re-download it. Yeah, the whole iteration. Yeah. yeah. So that's in a nutshell what you could do on-premises. And obviously now we just did PowerShell. You can imagine that calling this endpoint, this local host endpoint, can be done from different services. There's no need to do that from PowerShell. You could use webhooks. You could use search. You could use... I don't know, API, SharePoint Framework Web Arts, mm -hmm. um, event receivers. So any, um, any point in SharePoint where you can extend, you can just get the data that you want to extend, inject it into your model or send it to your model, get back data. Because now we are just using the response. We are reusing the response that we, uh, that we want to use. But obviously we could do custom logic where we say, hey, if the score is below a certain threshold, don't update. Or only if the score is above a certain threshold and there were entities, enrich my content with the entities that we're looking for. So is this the only way that we can use Azure on-premises? So is this only Lewis or are there other scenarios no. as well? It's amazing. It's not just only Lewis. Um, I, I lately did uh, a demo with uh, Custom Fission as well. So um, I could show that actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can show, show it. it. So I just showed you how Lewis works uh, or how you can export a Lewis model, but there is another way um, or another service you can also use. Um, some of you may know Custom Vision. It's also a cognitive service of uh, Microsoft Azure. And what I can do here is I, I also got the Custom Vision application running, which is very sophisticated. What my custom good. yeah, what my custom vision project can do actually is it's it's right here. I'm really good at creating demos. So and I'm always get hungry at demos. 
So I got a custom fishing model that uh, is trained using pizza images. And uh, we have in, in the Netherlands, we eat a lot of tosties, which are basically uh, bread with, with cheese. Croque-monsieur. Croque-monsieur. We really love it. And these two look the same, basically, a pizza or a tosti. It's, it looks kind of the same. So my custom fishing model can understand which is what. Now, this is also in the cloud. So, for example, you're in a situation where you want to classify what kind of uh, object is in the image, like object dete detection or object recognition. Then normally you would go uh, the same way as you go with Lewis. You create an application, which I did here. I train the model and then I call the API, uh, which is hosted in the cloud, to get um, uh, yeah the, the object that is in my uh, image. So this, again, is, is online. But what you can do is you can actually download this entire model uh, the same way as what we did to Lewis uh, to the cloud or to your on-premise situation or uh, edge device or whatever. Um, the only uh, thing I would like to give to you guys is, when I go back, you need to make sure that when you create a new project with this custom vision uh, cognitive service, make sure that you select a compact domain because these compact domains, they get uh, smaller or whatever. Uh, they, they use probably different algorithms or, or smarter or whatever. Uh, so if you don't choose for the compact domain, uh, you cannot download the uh, container and use it uh, in, in an offline situation. So that's one thing. But this is just another example, like custom fishing. You can do the, the same thing for entity recognition or for sentiment analysis. analysis. Um, it's crazy what you can do nowadays with, with just a simple, a few clicks and a few trainings. It's, it's crazy, really. So basically you're saying that I'm a developer and I don't need to worry about the data scientist mm -hmm. stuff. I can just explain, please create the models. Please use the Azure services to actually create and train them. And once you're finished or once you have a 0 0.1 or a 0 0.2, just tell me that it's there and I can use it locally, run it in a Docker container and yeah. I'm done. Yeah. So it always helps if you're a data scientist because then you understand how the data works and you get easier to the point. But there's, yeah, you, you as a developer, you can do the same, just, yeah. Oh, that, sounds, that sounds good. So taking it one step further, you actually have things like um, the CLI, the Azure CLI, or you can use PowerShell, whatever you want to use. You could actually go through the REST endpoints of Lewis and you could go to the REST endpoint of Custom Vision and actually say, I want to publish my model or I want to download my model. And then you could make an automated process where you, I don't know, whenever there is a new version of your model, you could actually download it, put it in the correct location, re um, reboot your your virtual uh, or your Docker virtual uh, virtual image. Maybe you want to um, pull the latest version every week or every mm -hmm. two weeks. So you can have like a real DevOps experience. Yeah, you should really have an MLOps yeah. experience, yep. Yep. regardless whether you're on premises or in the cloud. Right? Exactly. Yep. That sounds really good. That sounds really good. So with that. We captured pretty much everything we, we want to capture. So let's go through what we actually did, um, making sure that we are uh, we are not skipping anything. So we created a Lewis model and we added intents. We could also create a custom vision model or we could create a Azure um, analysis or Azure search, doesn't really matter. Most models that are out there currently can be downloaded. So that's good. The only requirement before you can actually download it is that it has to be trained and published. Yeah. If it's not published, you cannot download it, period. If you download the model, make sure that you remember what the name is. And there is one tiny, tiny remark. If you download the model for the second time, Windows will automatically add a underscore two or a bracket one or bracket two uh, at the end of the name. If you then put the model in your Docker container, it will still use the old model because, well, that's the correct name. It took us. Yeah, it happened. <laughs> I'm not going to admit it, but it took us like two hours because, well, we were it wasn't working and we didn't know why. And yeah, renaming. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. That's um, a quick remark. Yeah. Then, if the 
download a model is in the correct place. You have to run and install Docker. There are some blog posts out there that explain if you want to run Docker on a Azure VM, you have to have Hyper-V enabled. If it's not enabled by default, so you have to enable it, but no big deal, pretty, pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. The only thing that took us quite some time is you have to run Docker as an administrator before it starts running. Then obviously you have to start Docker with your downloaded model, otherwise it will work. And then you can connect from SharePoint to Docker with PowerShell, with webhooks, from your search index, with custom code, anything, Endless. anything you like. Yep. And obviously this is not something that is bound to SharePoint. If you have another application or you want to enrich I don't know, SQL data, whatever you want to think uh, think about, you can just enrich it as long as you can call your local Docker container that's running. And obviously the Docker container now is installed on a SharePoint VM, but you can install it on a dedicated VM, uh, put some networking in place and make sure that the endpoint is available and that, uh, that you can use it. With that, what we uh, what would we do differently? Because any project wouldn't be a proper project if we wouldn't spend time on reflecting mm -hmm. on how to work with it. In our demo that we did on our customer, we scored between 80 and 95% with auto tagging, so the get metadata based on the content that we have. And we spent around 10 days working on it, but we're no data scientists. No, yeah. We're really, really into development, really into AI, but we believe that if you would have a data scientist or if we would have some more training and how to faster. work yeah. with data, it would be way and way better. Mm -hmm. So our tip is if you ever start a project like this, please consult with a data scientist. Let them at least explain the basics because we learned along the way and it took quite some time yeah. to actually learn. It was fun, but and, it took long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had some technical nights. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, we would love to extract more data. So not only from files that you're processing, but also from other backend systems. That means if you are retrieving data from your documents and you get, I don't know, an alpha or a project number, you can use that project number or you could use that alpha to get data from CRM or get data from the Active Directory. So you can actually enrich your data even more. And that has nothing to do with, with AI, I guess. That's just... Um, if you have AI that tells you or um, provides you with additional intel, you can then reuse that intel to go even, uh, even further. Finally, um, we just had one model, mm -hmm. we worked with it and it worked fine, but you would really want to go to ML ops or DevOps where you could keep retraining your model and keep downloading newer versions uh, and learn from your mistakes or learn from the data you've, uh, you've gotten from your set. Yep. And with that, that's uh, that's it. We put our Twitter handles on, the, on there. So if there are any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, I don't see any questions in the comments as of no, now. No questions at the moment. So if you would need to build this ourselves, it would only take us an hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we, we did it for the first time in 10 days. So I would go with the safe side, let's spend 10 days. But now that I know, or now that we know what we were doing, I would say that you can set it up in roughly a day. Yep. And then your model wouldn't be, wouldn't be as, as accurate as you need it for a production scenario. But if you want to convince a client, because that's the thing that we see, convincing clients that AI adds value isn't really hard. Convincing a client that they need to spend money on AI, that's rather uh, yeah. complex. So if you can go to a client and say, OK, we can do a demo, we can do a proof of concept where we can show you what your data will look if we uh, pull it through a model, then you can see, hey, it's really not that hard to do things with it, right? Yeah. Cool, cool. So at the end, you're not really retrieving new information out of the document. Eh? It's because somehow you're training it to get specific information out of it, right? With yeah, Lewis so model, it's, it's not like you're doing using the text analytics uh, APIs to to retrieve like uh, organization names and all those things. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. That's so. Um, you can also do that, of course. In the scenario that we did, what we did is we picked the four first pages because in the four first pages there was always an introduction text, and we were sure that there was at least a client name, and we used text analytics to pick up the client name, and we used Lewis 
to figure out what the document was for. Was it a report for a client? Was it a, um, a billing statement? Was it, um, um, I don't know, a, a, a project report or whatever we were looking for? And we used that to edit as a content type into SharePoint. And then we could use the SharePoint search experience to say, hey, I'm looking for contracts or I'm looking for project reports or I'm looking for project reports created for that client by that person. Cool, cool. Uh, so yes, if there's any questions, uh, we don't have any for the moment, but they can reach you. I'll share your slides again through your uh, Twitter handles. So Albert or Api <laughs> and yeah. Rutger, thank you very much for for your time. Uh, I personally really enjoyed the session. It was a, a different much. way of doing, stuff, especially with Lewis. Never thought about it by using it like that. We, I personally <laughs> only view chatbots, but not for other. Uh, well, I guess that's a good oh, thing, right? Yeah, true, true. It's uh, different. Is not always bad, eh? <laughs> yeah, no. It's very interesting. Cool. So I'm going to grab our next speaker. Hi, Ali Beck. Hi, Hi everyone. Hi, how are you doing? I'm well, thank you. That's our Can you introduce session. yourself? Yeah, it was, it was. <laughs> Can you introduce yourself to us for the people who do um, not know yes, you? Of course. Uh, yeah, yes, of course. I'm Ali Beck, Ali Beck Jakupa from, uh, from a French software company expert time and I'm working there as a data scientist. So I'm working mainly on Azure platforms. So anything concerning uh, industrialization of uh, data science machine learning solutions. So, so it's, uh, it's what I'm doing every day. What will you be talking about today? Um, today I'm, go uh, I'm going to talk about uh, protective cloning detection using Azure, uh, using Azure custom vision service. Um, just one remark, it's not, it has nothing to do with, uh, with the actual context because uh, the application itself was developed uh, in 2018. So it was before the, uh, the global pandemic. Yeah. So uh, there is nothing to do with, uh, with the actual context, but it may be adapted and applied in the, um, in the actual one. So, yeah. That's true. Cool. Um, Ali Beck, I also need to thank um, you that you no. wanted to fall in so quickly for doing the session since our the, the speaker who was going to speak had to drop out because of uh, personal reasons so we're very happy you could uh, give the session today um if you share your screen with me with us then i can give you the um, word i think there's a, there's a some network connection issue oh, okay. I, I can i can no hear problem. it just Hello, Ali Beck, can you hear us? Ali Beck, maybe you need to try to rejoin the call. Albert Jan and Rutger, do you guys hear me? Yeah, I can, I can still uh, hear you. Well, right now, I can hear you. Oh, ah, okay, perfect. There were some, some network issues, so right now it's all right, I think. Because when I started sharing my, there was a there was a trouble too. Uh, yes, okay. so I'll finish well, my screen and my screen after. Okay, cool. So that then, please share your screen with us. Okay, great. Yeah. So Ryan, right, can you? We can, can see you, your... can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so as I said before, so today I'm going to, to talk about the cloning detection with Azure Custom Vision. I'm working as a data scientist at Expert Time and also Microsoft uh, most valuable professional uh, in the AI domain. Uh, and so uh, so what what the use case? As I said before, the, that was a project that I developed for a client in 2018. Uh, it was the end of 2018, and uh, the project itself consisted in uh, 
uh, creating a, a Windows 10 application. So, so a desktop like, application. Maybe you can stop sharing your uh, camera. It can be installed on any, um, on any uh, computer and uh, connected to a USB, just with a USB camera. So there were some, um, oh, there were, there were some that? investigations beforehand, before the project, yes? I think it's better to stop sharing your yes, camera I mean, because yeah. your network is bad. If you stop your camera, yeah. Ah, okay, sorry. Maybe that will help. Um, okay, great. Let's try this, see if it's better. Yeah. I think it will help because my baby, uh, I've got some some network issues here. Uh, can you hear me? I can Am I audible? I can hear you, yes. But it goes up and down. So I'll, I'll let you know Sammy? if it gets worse. I can hear you. Uh, so just let me know. If there are some, uh, there are any issues, uh, I will stop and so I'll start draw again. There's a lot of issues, Alibek. Uh, Sammy, it's all right? Yes. No, no, it's not fine. Am I still online? Oh, okay, great. Yeah, still online, so, as I said before, well. so the, the goal was to develop an oh, Okay, sorry. <laughs> Um, Maybe okay, there's a workaround, so just, just a second. Okay. Uh, just, it's for me, I can, I can hear you. I can, hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, but only once yes. in a while. Yeah, it, yeah. It's with the disruptions all the time. You. Okay. What about me? I can hear you, Ali Beck. Okay, I think it should work better right now because I've just I've turned off all the um, all the devices that are connected to the network. Okay, cool. Um Can you hear me? So just let me know if, there are, if you can hear me. If uh, when, hear when you. should we start? I can hear you. Okay. So I've just turned off everything I have. So I've turned off VPN, all the devices connected to the network, okay. uh, and hopefully it will work out. It's better. It's much better. Okay. So the. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, sorry for for the or or as always. As uh, we're all working from home, so there were always some technical troubles. Um, so, um, so if we go back to the context of the application, the main goal was to develop a Windows 10 application that can be installed installed on any computer uh, to connect it to USB camera, and the application had to detect multiple operators simultaneously and to detect whether they they are actually wearing um, all the protective equipment or not. And um, certainly there were some investigations beforehand. Uh, so what we have analyzed so far is uh, using is applying deep learning, uh, like uh, just creating guest model from scratch, using CMTK, which is a cognitive toolkit, uh, TensorFlow, Keras, which is a high level, um, high level uh, Python package that allows actually working with TensorFlow and CMTK too. Um, there were also, uh, cascade classifiers that we have analyzed too, uh, well, mainly using OpenCV, 
Uh, and actually, it was also a transfer learning solution. So uh, using Custom Vision API, uh, and actually the the API that allows to create uh, to create a classification model uh, just by using all an, uh, an already pre-trained model. And um, um, so, first of all, as as I said before, so we started analyzing deep learning solution, and so we've tried using L series VMs uh, with GPU acceleration. Um, important. So well, it should be mentioned that right now deep learning virtual machine no longer exists. Uh, all the all the deep learning all the DLVMs are replaced by DSVMs, so data science virtual machines. And uh, right now, it's up to you to decide whether you are willing to use uh, a data science virtual machine with support of GPU or not. Um, so well, there is no difference in right now in DLVM and uh, DSVM. Uh, so here, what it what it used to be like before. So when we uh, when we train our our model. Uh, and actually, right now the interface is still the same, so it's up to you to um, to choose the number of uh, of CPUs, of virtual CPUs, the number of uh, you know, the um, the capacity of your virtual machine. Um, so, just for for testing purpose, we have chosen these classical examples. Uh, that uh, is actually optical character recognition. So uh, this is quite quite straightforward. So we've got a, a database of, uh, of a couple of just of a couple of thousands of images uh, with um, with each image corresponding to this or that character. Uh, in our case, it's only only digits. And uh, so what we've created so far is actually a, um, a network uh, with a three hidden network with three hidden layers. And um, so, what what did it look like? So it's actually we've decided define a batch of uh, five hundred iterations. Uh, for those who are not familiar with machine learning with uh, networking, um, the the batch is actually when uh, when you're working with neural networks, uh, the um, when you're adjusting your weights is actually. Uh, you define the logic. So whenever you adjust, after if you adjust the weight after each iteration, uh, it, it is called online learning. And so, well, but if you adjust your weights after each iteration, so it may be called uh, uh, like in our in our case, so it's like batch uh, batch training. So here we define the classif well, classifier based on neural network classifier with a batch of five hundred. And uh, see, it was not so bad. We had uh, an accuracy of ninety-eight uh, percent, uh, but still there were some there were some issues with uh, with the solution. So uh, the um, the advantage of this uh, of this kind of uh, solution is actually its flexibility. Uh, so it's quite flexible, and so it's up to you to to uh, to choose the uh, the application context uh, and the also the precision level. Uh, but still, there were some drawbacks as the time, the complexity, and also the a large data set that was needed to to train your to actually to train your uh, to your classifier. And in our case, we didn't. Uh, in our case, we didn't have a a, a large uh, data set to to fulfill our training. So that's why it was actually crucial for us. Uh, we also analyzed TSK classifiers. Uh, so as you can see here, so there are um, it's actually a cascade classifier that uh, that is quite a classical one that is pre-built pre 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 in uh, in OpenCV. Um, there is a there is a sorry. I'm sorry, there were some network issues. Um, so with cascade classifiers, that is actually uh, is usually is usually used for uh, face detection. Uh, we define um, several type of features as you see here. So, uh, we apply these features to our image to detect whether, for instance, uh, here to detect whether uh, a face is present uh, on the scene or not, and. Um, 
uh, logical this that generates a great number of features uh, of about, of about 160,000 features that uh, um, that is actually tremendous uh, with a tremendous number of features we, that we cannot pass to the M12 classifier. And that's why we're using Ada Boost. Uh, so it's uh, just to, to reduce our feature space. And finally, to be able actually to create a, a classifier. So actually, Yada Boost is, is a combination of, uh, of many small classifiers. And finally, we're, we're actually choosing the best classifier. And the best classifier is actually the classifier that contains the most relevant features that we need to to, um, to consider while implementing our solution. Um, one of, uh, of uh, a huge advantage of this uh, of this kind of solution is uh, is actually its velocity. We're not talking about the the data uh, the data training uh, the um, the classifier training speed. It's actually data is actually real time processing. It is really good. Uh, and uh, it is also open source, so there is uh, no license you need to buy, so, uh, which is all, which is also important in certain cases. Uh, but the drawback is uh, in the precision. We got a lot of false positive. Uh, for instance, for, for those ones who have already played with OpenCV and uh, implemented phase detection using Harakis case, uh, one can one can see that. Uh, it is quite so. It works really good if the conditions uh, are good. Uh, but whenever you change your conditions, so there are there are much there are a lot of false positive, uh, which is actually very crucial in the kind this kind of application because uh, the application may detect um, a wall as a person, and uh, it may consider him uh, may consider the wall which is actually not a person as a as a operator. Wearing a good, uh, wear all the wearing all the equipments, which is not good. Um, there is also a certain set of programming skills which is required for for training your your classifier, and uh, is, uh, there is also um, there is also actually a large training set needed. But uh, why did they say that it's quite different from creating a deep learning? Because if you're working with OpenCV on mm -hmm. Linux on Linux environments, um, large training set is not really an issue. Because there is a built-in, there are the built-in facility in OpenCV that allows you to generate a large data set in just actually no time. Because there is a comment, and for instance, if you are detecting objects in a scene, so you're creating um, several images of your object uh, that you put on a on a background, and OpenCV has a, a large uh, set of backgrounds that the image is applied on, and um, with with a single comment, you may generate about 10,000 uh, 10, images that may be later uh, treated in your in your, in your cascade. Uh, and well, obviously there is no user user friendly interface because it is actually a programming library, and so uh, you need to be you need to be a programmer to to be able to use OpenCV. Uh, so actually, what is transfer learning? Is uh, is a recent facility that allows you to to remove the the last the last hidden layer of your neural network, which is actually responsible for given predictions, and you're replacing it with your own your own data. In this case, you don't need to have a, a large data set to be to be able to to train a classifier, and uh, uh, as there is already. A, a huge neural network had been trained beforehand. And we're talking about a really large neural network that, for instance, was trained by Microsoft with Microsoft data. Um, so this, this is really may be great. Uh, well, so uh, one of the huge advantages of this, uh, of this kind of solution is, uh, is uh, actually image processing speed. There is no uh, image processing, pre-processing that you need to to perform to be able to use Azure Custom Vision. So the only thing you need to do is to generate um, a small data set of uh, uh, just with a, about a, at least 50 images for each uh, for each class, and you can upload everything to to cloud, and uh, so Azure will do all this stuff for you. Um, so for 
uh, certain type of classifiers um, that are maybe really high precision in the in the data analysis. And um, the one of the drawbacks is actually there are limits in um, in precision. See, for I talking about a really a really um, tight precision. For instance, if we are well willing to detect if uh, the position of an object is good or not. Like for instance, if we are talking about a retail uh, a retail context, so if we want to to analyze whether the object is present on a um, on a shell or not, uh, it may work just really with a really high precision. But if we want to detect whether the object is is well placed, is play it just is well placed on the on the good position, uh, so there may be there may be uh, some issues. But with a, with a new facility with Azure Custom Vision that allows uh, training a, uh, allows uh, launching a, an advanced training, uh, which is paid, uh, you may really you may really have a, a very accurate model. Uh, so, so what you have done so far is actually created. So we've just obviously I've chosen using transfer learning because we did not have a large data set, but we wanted to. To launch the process of the data generation, uh, starting with uh, with a really small data set, to be able to um, to increase the um, to increase the size of our training set step by step. Uh, so what we've done so far, we actually with Microsoft to organize a, a folder session that we uh, where we created nine classes. Uh, so as as you can see, there are there are three elements. In the in the protective equipment, so there is a um, uh, there is a head protection, there is a, there's a blouse, and uh, there is a mask. Uh, but still, if we want to or our model to to say what are the missing elements in our equipment, uh, we need to um, to provide all the possible combinations. So as you can see here, so we. We've created all the possible combinations uh, with, a, with, a, with an operator wearing no equipment, uh, from starting from the operator with no equipment to the operator that has all the possible equipment. Uh, so here in the demo of what we have done so far, as you can see, uh, our model detects whether there's a shirt. Uh, in one scene. We also, you know, so our model actually, it, it, just to be clear, the model does not, model does not analyze uh, what are the elements that are missing. Actually, the model is trying to predict one of nine classes that we defined before. And for phase detection, we are using hair cascade. Just here, we used hair cascade, uh, but we'll, we'll see further that it may be improved. Uh, as um, as you can see, so right here it will work fine because uh, the conditions are, uh, are good for, for model detection, but for phase detection. Uh, but still, you may have seen that there was there was a, um, a false positive, and in this case, uh, it is also possible to use in order to to improve the, the model quality. It is also to to possible to use cafe model. Which I'm me personally, I would recommend you to you to do, and uh, the rest is actually it actually is the same. So what we've done so far to create this model, we've trained a, a multi-class a, a, a single label multi-class classifier, and we we've created a compact model, a, a compact uh, project because we we needed to to run it locally, and uh, here so what we've done so far we we actually. After training our model, we exported it to TensorFlow and uh, we used it with. Uh, so, move forward, next slide. Um, and uh, we have using it using uh, with uh, with OpenCV. Uh, so, just to sum up, where to to create an application, uh, we we created an OpenCV just to to be able to treat the uh, the the video flow. And uh, to launch the classifier, we used, we used uh, TensorFlow. Uh, 
with the, with the model that we exported from custom vision. In this case, there is a no network connection and the model runs fully locally. So what, what were the issues while development? So as I said before, true positive. Uh, there was also a uh, distance and light condition. Um, there was also a user scenario uh, because, uh, uh, for instance, if we uh, install the application at the entrance of the, uh, because the application initially was developed for the, for the factories. And uh, so if we install the application on a computer that is set up uh, at the entrance of the, of the factory, uh, they may be issue because uh, after entering the factory, um, an operator may uh, put off the the clause, and there is no way to 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 try this. And uh, also, there were uh, some computing speed issues that we actually succeeded to uh, to resolve. Uh, so um, there are some also tip, tips and tricks that we would like to share with you. Is actually using Python 3.6 is much better than if you are working on Windows, which is actually the case because uh, one of the conditions of our project was in a Windows 10 application, so an application that may be installed on any Windows environments. Um, so we do recommend using Python 3.6 because uh, uh, 3.7 didn't work with the TensorFlow and uh, 3.8 uh, 3 neither. Um, so that's why 3.6 is the most the most stable version of uh, Python working with TensorFlow. Um, it is also recommended to use cold light for better phase detection. But if you are using the Caffey models, so there is uh, there is no problem with a uh, with the warm warm light. Um, yeah. So to define an optical camera distance, there is a there is no recommendation because there is something that may be defined empirically. Uh, you can define only by testing your application in uh, real world environments. And also the screen size. Uh, do not forget to, to adjust your, uh, for instance, as you've seen before, so we've created some icons in our application. So there are, the icons should adjust, should be adjusted not according to the to the um, to the face size, but mainly to the in to the, to the screen size. So uh, because you if you uh, if the application has a as a second screen and where when you're sharing the application on the second screen, there may be some issues uh, mainly cons concerning the UX UI, and um, so that is a that is really useful. Uh, so what you have done so far to improve face detection, we have actually applied. Uh, DNN, so a deep neural network uh, in uh, in OpenCV, because starting from OpenCV three, there is uh, there are this facility that allows us as using um, OpenCV with CAFE models. Uh, the only thing you need to do is actually download the CAFE model and download the proto.txt file. The proto.txt file containing all the weights uh, that are actually crucial for our model. Um, to improve the processing speed, we actually used, uh, so after the, the project ended, so we've tried uh, running the project uh, on a Linux environment. And it actually, there was a dramatic difference between the, um, the performance on Windows and on Linux. Even the, uh, the logos, uh, they appeared more beautifully on Linux than on Windows. Uh, and also there is, a, as we said before, uh, the UX you should be adapted uh, according to the um, to the real world conditions and according to the scenario. Uh, because the application that we developed so far was uh, as the application was developed for the uh, for the factories, uh, the we need we actually had to rework the, the scenario after we have installed everything. Um, during the expo, because the application was first presented during the expo, and uh, it actually, after we have installed the application, that's where started to um, to to notice that there are some troubles because during the development phase, when it was running only in, uh, in our office, the the model actually performed perfectly. Uh, 
Um, so as I said before, so you may use the CAFI models and um, uh, we also, just to improve quality, there are, there are also some, some tips and uh, tricks that we need to limit actually the, um, the analysis, the, the, uh, the, the area of, of the zone uh, that, is, that is analyzed. And uh, as you noticed before, uh, so the application didn't actually uh, make difference between uh, between the mask that is well put or bad, badly put because uh, yes, ideally the mask should cover all the face, including the nose. Uh, and uh, the previous models, it actually did not succeed to to make a difference between um, between two different uh, cases. And with a new version of the application, we actually succeeded to improve. Uh, to improve the quality by actually creating multiple classes, but which are actually focusing multiple models that are focusing only uh, specific points. Uh, so we've created a, mod a, a different model to detect whether is uh, whether the operator is wearing or not uh, the the prosthetic clothing. And another um, and another another model was actually analyzing. Uh, whether if all the equipment is is already is already put on, uh, if there are if uh, whether the the clothing actually covers all the um, all the the whole face. Um, another another tip is is that just one may need to to visualize a model, and uh, there is no way to visualize your model. On Azure Custom, uh, on Azure Custom Vision, inter uh, on Azure Custom Vision site, you're on your workspace using using an interface. But where the will, where there is a will, there is a way. And uh, we actually succeeded to visualize the model using TensorBoard. And uh, uh, the code is uh, is uh, is available on my GitHub. So you may you may just please feel free to take it and to test. Uh, your uh, custom vision models with uh, with sensor board. It, it may be useful if you want to analyze the weights, uh, the different nodes, uh, and uh, different layers of your ne neural network. We uh, we also tried using some edge computing. Uh, we've used uh, Jetson now, uh, which is actually which is actually exactly. Uh, with a, with a machine that works exactly as, as Raspberry Pi, for instance, but a support for a GPU, and which is which is great because uh, when we're talking about computer vision, so we, we really need this. And um, so what we've tried so far, we just copied the, the whole project because as it was written in Python, so there is nothing to change, and we copied the whole the whole source project to the to to this uh, uh, Jetson Nano uh, because it's, it's running under Linux and we've, we've tested it. Uh, so what are the conclusions of testing the, the code of, uh, that is, was initially written for Windows and uh, that we have tested on Linux and on Jetson Nano is actually that generally on Linux it works better but when we're talking about Jetson Nano um, there were some performance issues, uh, and me personally, I would recommend you to to rewrite your code on C++ because with C++ you may achieve a better performance. Um, if we take a look, there were some, there were some defined applications that are initially written in C++. Uh, this one is, for instance, for for pedestrian detection. And it was actually bad, and it was actually good. Sorry, uh, and as you see, there are um, it is quite fluent. And uh, if we test, if we test the applications, for instance, uh, um, a SIM classifier. So you see, actually, it's able to detect uh, whether it's a patchback. So it's actually it hesitates between patchback and hairspray. Um, uh, we also tested it with a uh, with a pencil. 
and with a mouse. You can still use it as a joystick. Well, that's all right. There is another issue with the, with the model quality, but the main the main thing that uh, we we see here is actually it's uh, it's it's fluency. So there is no issue in running actually the model, which is which is very huge. Uh, and uh, uh, Jetsunana is out, is is able to to perform data classification to to perform C classification in a, in a real time with uh, with no lagging. And uh, so we've done so far. So when we tested our application using uh, using uh, Python, so as you see, it is much less much less fluent. Uh, so, just to to sum up, so uh, the uh, what are our recommendations if you were if you are willing to perform this kind of application is actually to get familiar with OpenCV because OpenCV is actually a great uh, a great open source library that uh, that allows you to to perform some data pre processing and even for working with TensorFlow or Keras and CNTK. It doesn't really matter because you you really need to pass or by OpenCV beforehand to to do some um, important data preprocessing. Uh, there is also, uh, as we said before, so there is also a way to export your model if we're using custom version. So you do not need to have uh, you don't you don't have to 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 call the API each 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 time you are predicting. You are predicting class locally, so you can always export your model and uh, and use it using Python and TensorFlow or uh, ONX or ML.net. Just anything, almost anything you want. And with uh, with the last release, you can also use TensorFlow GS if you want to to have a really beautiful application and uh, use some JavaScript libraries. Uh, there is a way to integrate Azure. Uh, custom vision project into into your into your JavaScript project, and um, that's it. Uh, so the the main goal was to to show that we're actually able to uh, to create a really good classifier with with almost no data and to to improve the quality iteratively step by step by adding some um, some additional models. Uh, some additional data, and uh, and which is also important is to to really uh, work on your uh, application scenario. How you you really need to think of how the application may be uh, installed on the on the real production environments, and uh, that was uh, this is really important because it actually impacts your uh, your your application design and. It, it also impacts your your model because uh, depending on the context or depending on the um, on the uh, on the UX or on the user interface, you may you may be willing to create one single model that does everything at once, or maybe creating or separating uh, your project into two different models, uh, each doing. Uh, for instance, if you get a multi-step verification, so. It is actually um, much much easier to create uh, to create uh, several models for for each step, just uh, to have a better performance and a better accuracy. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Hey Sami, Mr. Hi. 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 Yeah, I'm really sorry for the for for the network issues because actually I was there were some. Some Maybe you can uh, stop sharing and come back on. It's nicer to talk. OK. Uh, so if I'm right, uh, uh, just stop sharing my screen. Yeah, OK, perfect. Well, you can always put on back your camera if you want. So. Um, I saw what you so you try to build a model with custom vision. 
and you build it a model uh, from scratch. Is there a way to... Um, not sure. Uh, well, actually, so far, we, we, we've tested different models. We've mm -hmm. tested different before starting the project. And uh, so we actually, we, we tried creating a model from scratch uh, using, uh, using hair cascades or mm -hmm. just uh, creating a cascade. And after analyzing these all these approaches, we we have finally decided to 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 use uh, custom vision okay. because it was it was much easier and we it we, we it allowed us uh, having a uh, well a better performance. Yeah, and it's it's very easy to to work with also also uh, our previous speakers Api and Rutger showed us a little bit about uh, custom vision how to use it so. It's a, an awesome product. Yeah, yeah, of course. How was your experience with the Jetson? That's something I, I still would like to try out. Ah, you're, you're welcome. One. So, uh, well, um, I don't think I would publish an article on this, but uh, I'll, still, I'll I'll try to, to share my experience uh, just to, to share some code on GitHub. Because actually, it's great. It's great because you can have a, you can have a, your your model running on a tiny machine, and uh, you may install it actually anywhere. And it also it may also influence your your user scenario. You don't need to adapt uh, to adapt your user interface to uh, to your computer to to, uh, to the environments. Because as I said before, the main issue was actually was how can we install how can we install the project on a in a in a real industry in a real industrial environment, and uh, in mm -hmm. this case, Nano may be a real solution. Yeah. Nice. Okay, Alibek, thank you very much again. Thank you for falling in today for a speaker that had to drop out. So very grateful for that. You're welcome. Any. Thank you very uh, much for the presentation. Uh, you're welcome. If there's any questions for you, they can also reach you on Twitter. Uh, so, of course, uh, if you just look on on my Twitter handle or something, and you will find your uh, Twitter because it's well, it's not just a name; it's with some numbers. <laughs> I always forget what it is. Sorry. What is it? It's uh, just say what's your uh, your Twitter handle again. Uh, my Twitter is a j a k u p o v one. It's actually my uh, the first letter of my surname, uh, the first letter of my name, my surname, and one. Ajakupov number one. <laughs> Ajakupov one, yes, because Ajakupov was already occupied. <laughs> then you need to add a number to it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, cool. For all the ones who are still listening. Um, we, of course, now this this uh, event is organized by Data Minds. We have Data Minds Connect in October. It will be a virtual event. So registrations are opening up very soon, but also the call for speakers is closing very soon. So if you still would like to speak on Data Minds Connect virtual, well, then just go to datamindsconnect.be and there you will find all the information you need uh, also, registrations and everything will be found there. So, thank you very much for joining today. If you want to see more sessions like this, just click the like button, uh, subscribe on the channel, and we'll make sure it comes all the way to you. So, thank you very much. A good evening, and see you soon. Yeah. Hey, my name is Function Malik, and I'm from Melbourne. Fixing Sami in Belgium. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Hi. Amy. Amy. I'm Prasant from California. Hello, I'm Prasant from California. Hi, I'm Jennifer Marsman from the United States. Hi, I'm Elizabeth from India. Hi, I'm Matthew Renton from the USA. I'm George Pizak from California. Hi, I'm Abby Daoud from the Africa. Hi, I'm Anna Falana. Hello, I'm Turkey. I'm Darunyanda. Hi there. Hi. Hi. Hi.